Good morning. Good morning. I love it. Brother Kenny's going to come and say our prayer for us this morning. Good morning. Good to see everyone here today. Today, we are going to be uh, praying for the uh, tycoon of Myanmar, formerly of uh, Burma. They have a population of uh, approximately 100,000 people. And uh, this is what our booklet says. Uh, the uh, tycoon people live in north, northeast Myanmar, formerly Burma, and have uh, deeply rooted self-determination in their culture. Um, they are mainly uh, Theravada, Theravada Buddhists. Uh, they seek the daily uh, peas of uh, what they believe to be the spirit of the land and annually worship their ancestors. A uh, number of the uh, tycoon have become believers. One uh, tycoon pastor uh, said in, that in the past, the uh, Buddhist monks um, would mock them and ask if, they, if their God, if our God is so great, um, was, there, was there not a Bible in their language? Well, there now is a Bible in their language. The uh, Buddhist monks have requested numerous copies and are studying uh, intently. And a couple things came to my mind. If you guys ever get a chance to uh, check out uh, Wycliffe Bible translators. I'm not sure if they are the ones that uh, translated the Bible into this language, but uh, it's really amazing how they're able to uh, do that, the technology that they use. And the other thing that came to my mind, isn't that just like the Bible, that uh, you could be studying a particular topic and going through different passages of scriptures, and then all of a sudden you come across other passages of, of scripture that's totally unrelated, but you find it so meaningful. Uh, there's no other book like the Bible that will do that. You know, it's just uh, so special, and I would challenge you to find any book out there that can do what the Bible does, and uh, you'll probably, you know, I know you'll come up empty. But anyway, the uh, verse down here at the bottom is uh, so applicable. Dial in my bifocals here. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of the soul and spirit of joints and the marrow and, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. So uh, let's pray for the uh, tycoon people. Hey, Father, we thank you for this day that you've given us an opportunity to come and to worship you yet again. And Father, we want to lift up the uh, tycoon people of Myanmar to you. We thank you that uh, seeds have been sown in this area that uh, your word is available to them. We just pray that you would uh, anoint your word, continue to uh, pierce the hearts of the souls so that there would be so many more people that would come to know you as Lord and Savior. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We're glad to have Pastor Kevin and Lisa back. Good news is they were only gone four days and nobody died and I didn't have to preach a funeral. <laughs> that's good. You broke that. <laughs> so, so that's good. You know, nobody likes, nobody or very few people like change. They don't like change. You know, you get in the habit, you get in the rut and you don't like the change. But there's only one way to change your life. And that's through the blood of Jesus Christ. And uh, that's a good kind of change. That's the best change. And uh, there's power in that blood. Let's sing power in the blood. Let's stand while we sing. Would you be free from your burden of sin? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would your evil a victory win? There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the 
precious blood of the Lamb. Would you be free from your passion and pride? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Come for a cleansing to Calvary's tide. There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Would you be wider, much wider than snow? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Sin stains are lost in its life-giving flow. There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. This last verse we're singing in Baptist style. Okay? Baptist style on the last verse. Would you do service for Jesus your King? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you live daily His praises to sing? There's wonderful power in the blood. Here we go. There's power, 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 wonder-working power in the blood of the I get teased all the time when we sing that, that everybody better get an umbrella on the back of your head because when we do it Baptist style, everybody's <laughs> saliva goes all over somebody's back. But that's a good song. It's got a lot of pep. Lisa turned around and told Debbie, I'm glad you're sitting down. She said, <laughs> uh, we got requests to sing this next song this week, and uh, some of it's kind of new to some of them, but we, this is an old uh, chorus that we sang years and years ago, and it's a good, it's a good song. And while we're standing, we might as well be standing on holy ground, okay? <laughs> We are standing on holy ground, and I know that there are angels all around. Let us pray.
just came in, you're dismissed. Jude, chapter 1. Don't go to chapter 2. You'll you need a different Bible if you go to chapter 2. We're in the book of Jude. So, um, 
I hate to correct the math teacher, but Thursday to Saturday is three days, not four. You said four days. That we were gone. It's only because you were gone Wednesday night and you missed me. Uh, hey, we are going to um, be in this uh, interesting section um, in Jude. And um, originally I looked at splitting it up and going verses 10 through 16, or 11 through 16. But as I studied last week and this week um, on this, I, I decided that um, we needed to go back and review. Um, a little bit about verses, uh, especially eight through ten, and so before we even begin, let's let's just remember the three groups of people that that the that Jude talked about um, in verses five through seven. Who were those three groups? Do you remember? The Israelites, the children of Israel. You can look back at your notes. You can cheat. That's okay. Or look at the Bible. The angels that had fallen. All right. And who was the third one? Who is it? Sodom and Gomorrah, so those three groups of people, all of them rebelled against God. Today we're going to look at three people who rebelled against God. Um, and technically, when I really started looking at that, I was like, man, if I really, really, really felt led, and I didn't, I could do a whole week on each person. Um, and, and, and maybe someday we'll go back and look at that and do that. Um, but I think it's really important that we go back and look at that um, in depth. And really, when you look at Jude in these verses, if you go back and read Second Peter chapter 2 and 3, you're like, why is Jude repeating what Peter said? Um, it's like he's warning us over and over and over again about the past. Why? Because if you don't learn, you are going to... Repeat it, um, and that's something that's that we see in there. So um, it's kind of like what a parent does with a child. Why do I have to tell you over and over and over and over and over and over? I sound like a broken record, right? Uh, why do I have to tell you that over and over and over and over again? Because why? You don't listen. You just didn't get it. You just stubborn you're hard-headed you what you didn't learn the first time so you so we're going to tell you it over and over again right uh you need to know you need to be told exactly over and over and over again a million times these things and god is doing the same thing through jude for us i'm warning you over and over and over again listen pay attention um, and wise parents know that some things must be said over and over again for the safety and welfare of their children. God knows the same thing. He knows that we are stubborn, hard-headed, and that we will repeat the same mistakes that others have repeated before us. Amen? Amen? And that's also what Jude's going to do. And so he's warning us um, in this, this, this book over and over again not to make the same mistakes that the previous generation made. Okay? Um, a lot of times we'll sit and we'll read Scripture and we'll look at the children of Israel and they go, why didn't they get it? Why didn't they see God as he opened up the Red Sea? Why didn't they get that, what God, how powerful God is and how good God is to them? Why didn't they get that? Why didn't they understand that? And that's one of those times where we need to stop and look in the mirror and say, why don't I understand this? Why don't I get this? And it's over and over and over again that he's warning us. So with that in mind, let's stand, please. And we're going to read the entire book of Jude. I will read the odd, you read the even. Um, from the New King James Version or off the screen. Jude, a bondservant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to those who are called, sanctified by God the Father, and preserved in Jesus Christ. 
Beloved, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation, I found it necessary to write to you exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith, which was once for all delivered to the saints. But I want to remind you, though you once knew this, that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed those who did not believe. As Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them in a similar manner to these, having given themselves over to sexual immorality and gone after strange flesh, are set forth as an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. <clears throat> Yet Michael, the archangel, in contending with the devil when he disputed about the body of Moses, dared not bring against him a reviling accusation, but said, The Lord rebuke you. <clears throat> Woe to them, for they have gone in the way of Cain. They have run greedily in the air of Balaam for profit and have perished in the rebellion of Korah. Raging waves of the sea, foaming up their own shame, wandering stars for whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. <laughs> to execute judgment on all, to convict all who are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have committed in an ungodly way, and of all the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. But you, beloved, remember the words which were spoken before by the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. These are sensual persons who cause divisions not having the spirit. Keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. <clears throat> but others... Save with fear, pull, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment defiled by the flesh. To God our Savior, who alone is wise, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen. Father, thank you for the reading of your word. May it encourage us, may it bless our hearts, may we be moved by it. And Father, may you uh, remind us through this of the warnings that you're giving to us to be alert, to be aware that in these days that we live in, there will be false teachers, there will be false apost apostates, there will be those who reject the truth of the gospel. And, uh, Father, I pray that you will help us to be aware of that and that we would be faithful to your word as we just sing about your goodness and your faithfulness to us. May we also be faithful to your word and the truth of it. And, uh, Father, I thank you for that. Thank you for your mercy and grace. Lord, may you have your way in our hearts and lives today as we open our hearts to you uh, this morning. Uh, 
Teach us, mold us, shape us into your image. And Father, we thank you for this in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. All right, so all that Jude wrote about the apostates in these verses really can be summarized in three elements. In verses 8 through 10, and again, 8 through 10 is kind of like swing verses. They're kind of like pointing you back to 5 through 7, but they're also pointing you forward to 11 through 16. So the first point we're going to look at is uh, verses 8 through 11, which is they reject divine authority. They reject divine authority. Uh, They resort to deliberate hypocrisy, hypocrisy, and then they will receive their due penalty. Those are the three points we're going to look at today. So if we had an outline, uh, we would say verses 1 and 2 is the introduction. Verses 3 and 4 is the purpose. Uh, I wanted to write to you about this common salvation that we all have and encourage you about that, but the Holy Spirit is leading me in a different direction. Verses 3 and 4, the purpose of my writing this is to uh, warn you that there will be false teachers there will be apostates. Verses 5 through 7 are some historical examples. Uh, 8 through 16 is uh, uh, those historical examples of unbelief unbelief and rebellion. Uh, 8 through 16 are are going to, we're going to look at who are these apostates? Who are these false teachers? How are they described in these verses? And 17 through 23 is exhorting us to uh, to be good Christians and live that way, and we'll get to those in 24 and 25 is just a conclusion. So uh, they reject divine authority. Look again at verses 8 through 11. He says, uh, Likewise, these dreamers defile the flesh, reject authority, speak evil of dignitaries. Yet Michael the archangel, in contending with the devil, when he disputed about the body of Moses, dared not bring against him a reviling accusation, but he said, The Lord rebuke you. But these speak evil of whatever they do not know, and whatever they know naturally, like brute beast in these things, they corrupt themselves. Woe to them, for they have gone in the way of Cain, have run greedily the error of Balaam, for profit and perished in the rebellion of Korah. So, What we see in these verses is that all authority comes from the throne of God. Whether it is the authority at home, authority in in the public square, authority in the church, um, it's all from God. And those who exercise authority must be under authority. In other words, they must be accountable to God. If you believe God has determined everything, including your salvation before the foundation of the earth, then you are not accountable to God. He is accountable to you. And that is biblically wrong. We are accountable to God. God does not owe me anything. Nothing. What He has given to me is by His grace. It's because of His love. It's not because He owes it to me. Isn't that true? I mean, He, he doesn't owe me a, 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 a thing. But He willingly gives it to me out of His goodness. And so the cause of their rebellion is found in verse 8. They are dreamers. These are people who le- live in a dream world of unreality. Uh, They believe the lie that Satan told Eve. You shall be as gods. You shall be as gods. They've turned away from God's truth. They feed their minds on false doctrine. And those false doctrines inflate their egos, egos and encourage their behavior, their rebellion. We see that in Israel with the Muslims. What does is, what is their religion teach them? That if they die in a holy war, they will what? They will gain eternity with a thousand virgins. Well, whoop de doo If your eternity is not guaranteed in heaven, what good is there? Um... And so these people will will die, and they will encourage them to do these things. Jude 10, 
informs us that the apostates are ignorant people who do not know what they're talking about. And Jude echoes Peter's description in, in here, calling them brute beasts, animals that live by natural instinct. And we saw that a week ago in, God, in Israel. When men rebel against God, they sink to the level of animals. We see that in Israel. We also see that in America. The cause are, is their dreamers. The course here that we see is uh, of rebellion is um, they defile the flesh. They, they live to satisfy their animal, their animal lust. And so when a person despises God's authority, he feels free to disobey God, to disobey God and live as he pleases. And what he forgets is that those laws have penalties attached to them. They also use their tongues to speak evil in verse 8 and verse 10. And that word speak evil is the word blaspheme. And a lot of times we think of blaspheme. It's, it's totally against God, but it's also uh, making fun of or making light of God's salvation. The consequence of their rebellion is seen in their own ruin in verse 10. What do they do? They corrupt themselves, he says. They corrupt themselves. Um, they, they defile themselves. They destroy themselves. And they have the idea that they are promoting themselves. Okay, And so the way of rebellion leads to ruin. The way of rebellion leads to ruin. Um, verse 11 then gives us the condemnation of the false teaching. Uh, and, and what he says in here, look again at what he says. This, he says, woe to them, woe to those people that are like 11 through, through 10. Woe to them, why? Because they are like, they have, they, have, they, have, they have gone in the way of Cain. They have run greedily in the error of Balaam for profit. They have perished in the rebellion of Korah. Now, we could spend a lot of time just in this one verse. Um, but we're not going to. I'm going to highlight it, and we're going to hit some things in there, um, and we're going to move on. Um, Cain rebelled against God's way of salvation. God made it clear. Adam, Eve, the only way for salvation is by the shedding of blood. How did he forgive Adam and Eve? How did he show them to gain forgiveness? What did he do? sacrificed an animal and on that part he showed them the blood and the blood is the only way he could well, they could get forgiveness do you think they kept that to themselves or do you think they told their children i'm pretty sure they told their children and cain came along and knew the right way this is the way of faith you don't come to god by good works you come to god through the blood of jesus christ Cain rejected that. Cain came to the altar with the fruits of his own labor. And what did God do? He rejected his offering. His heart was not before God. It was by faith that Abel brought his sacrifice to God and God accepted it. The way of Cain, then, is the way of religion. Coming to God without faith. It is righteousness based on character and good works. The way of Cain is the way of pride. It is a man who is establishing his own righteousness and rejecting the righteousness of God. That's the way of Cain. Um, it is rejecting God's offering of Jesus Christ and coming to him by my own way. That is the way of Cain. The way of Balaam is in selling one's gifts and ministry for the sake of money. It is using the spiritual to gain the material. The false teachers were and are greedy for material things like Balaam would do anything for money. 
The heir of Balaam is thinking that they can get away with that kind of rebellion. Balaam was a true prophet of God. And it's some great, great reading um, in, in the um, book of Deuteronomy, I think it is. Or, uh, now I'm questioning myself. Somebody looked that up. Um, but he was a, Balaam was a true prophet of God. And he prostituted his gifts and he sought to destroy God's people. God turned Balaam's curses into blessings. While we are uh, on the subject, Revelation 2, verse 14, talks about the doctrine of Balaam, which is you can violate your separated position and get away with it. You can violate your separated position and get away with it. Here's what Balaam told King Balak to tell Israel to get them to defile themselves. He says, you are, you are God's chosen people. Certainly just a little bit of friendship with your enemies will not hurt you. It's the, what we just saw last week in Gaza and Israel. Let's open the gates. Let these people come in. They'll be daytime workers. We'll let them into our communities. We'll let them into our areas, and then they'll go home. Was that a good thing? No. God calls us to be separate from the world. We are to be separate from the world. We are to be in the world, but not of the world. In other words, we are to live with them. We are to work with them, but we, don't, we are not to act like them. The doctrine of Balaam says we'll let them in and we'll act like them. It's taking the grace of God and doing what he says in verse 4, bringing lewdness into the grace of God, accepting his salvation but living for the world. And God judged because of this sin both Balaam and the nation of Israel for following him. So the story, then the third thing, one that he mentioned is Korah. And you find that in Numbers 16. Um, and it centers on rebellion against authority. Korah uh, led a rebellion with several other followers because he resented the leadership of Moses. And he dared God to do anything about that. <clears throat> in speaking against Moses, they were speaking against God who had given Moses his authority. And here's the warning to us today. It's easy to speak against spiritual leaders. But be careful that we don't do it in a careless way. God judged Korah. God judged his followers. God established the authority of his servant, Moses. And Korah rebelled against that. And it cost him his life because the ground opened up and swallowed him. So here's what we see in those three things. Cain rebelled against God's authority in salvation. Cain rebelled against God's authority. He refused to bring a blood sacrifice. And it led to his ruin. Balaam rebelled against God's authority in separation. He prostituted his gifts for money. And that led Israel to mix with the other nations. And it would lead to their ruin. Korah rebelled against God's authority in service. He denied that Moses was God's appointed servant and attempted to usurp his authority. It's interesting to note also when you look in verse 11, uh, the different verbs that are, are used. He said they, the apostates have gone in the way, or some of your Bibles will say traveled on the road. You followed after the way of Cain. All right? Uh, they gave themselves over. They ran greedily into the error of Balaam. Um, they uh, perished in the rebellion of Korah. So here's what this ver these verses is, are telling us. The point is this. The tragedy of rejecting authority could be the loss of your soul. And it always leads to ruin. And it always leads to ruin. 
That brings us to number two. They resort to deliberate hypocrisy. Verse 12 and 13. These are spots in your love feast. While they feast with you without fear, serving only themselves, they are clouds without water, carried about by the winds, late autumn trees without fruit, twice dead, pulled up by the roots, raging waves of the sea, foaming up their own shame, wandering stars for whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. So we see here six vivid pictures of a false teacher. And hopefully this will help to explain why these are dangerous to the church today. Number one, or A, is they are filthy spots. Now I know some of your Bibles just say spots in our love feast, um, but that's what he's referring to as filthy spots. Um, and they are not adding to the fellowship. That's what that's referring to. They're not adding to the fellowship. Um, they are defiling the fellowship. They are a distraction to the fellowship. They are like Judas um, was a distraction to the fellowship of the Lord's Supper. Uh, the Greek word for spots is translated hidden rocks. They are hidden rocks. You've been walking around, all of a sudden a rock pops out and you fall over it. That's what he's talking about. You, you can um, quickly wreck your ship because of a hidden rock. Um, when we first moved to West Virginia, my uh, brother-in-law called and said, uh, said, hey, if we come down there... Um, you want to go whitewater rafting? And I was like, yeah, sounds great. They're not going to be open. It was the end of March. They're not going to be open. He calls, when he, get, when he gets here, he calls this company. He's like, yeah, we're open. I'm like, what? No. So we go whitewater rafting, and um, it's, the water temperature is 55 degrees, so they make us wear the wetsuits and everything. And so we get in the boat and we're going along and I'm in the one side and he's in the other and there was a an older not an older a middle-aged couple I, I changed it because I'm about their age now a middle-aged uh couple that were, were there and they had a German girl exchange student and um and the guide and that was it and so we're in this boat and we're going along and he's telling us how to go and what happens and everything and so we're going through all these holes that you hit these holes and you're digging it out and everything and everything's fine well, the lady says, I want to sit up front. And I was like, okay. So I changed with her. Um, and uh, she was behind me, and so she moved up, and I moved to the back, and we hit this hole. I think he said it was a class four. Um, and he, we hit this hole, and all of a sudden, it popped us up like this, and she went flying out. And I was like, where's she going? And I look over, and my brother-in-law's gone. It's like, was it the rapture or what? <laughs> and the, the guy's just yelling, paddle, paddle. And so we're paddling. And all of a sudden, we hit the backside of that, and I go whoosh, flying over. And that German exchange student fell out of the boat somehow. It had something to do with she didn't stop me. And so she was out you know over there and we hit a hidden rock that the guy said I didn't even know that was there and uh, we're like well now you know um, and to make a long story short I went to pull the lady in and I was like oh man she's bleeding because there was blood on her vest it's like oh man she's bleeding I hope she's okay and I pulled her in and I went to grab my brother-in-law and oh man he's bleeding wait I'm bleeding. <laughs> and I ended up with seven stitches um, because that's, that, that, uh, that was fun. Hidden rocks. <laughs> Hidden rocks will shipwreck your faith. Um, and so it's important that we are aware of those rocks at all times. Spiritual leaders must constantly be on guard for hidden rocks. Second thing is, 
shepherd, selfish shepherds. It's easy to say. Uh, these are spots in your love feast while they feast with you without fear, serving only themselves. Feeding means shepherding. Um, instead of shepherding the flock, instead of caring for the needs of the people, these apostates take care of themselves. They take advantage of God's people, using and abusing them, and they do all this without fear. It's the guys who say to you, uh, send me $100, and I'll send you a piece of the cloth that I used when I was crying and weeping. Uh, Fred should start that. Um, and, and they're like, oh, it brings magic. And it doesn't bring, there's nothing that brings magic. It's not, it's not some spiritual cloth. And they're an arrogant lot. Um, and they're really not a shepherd. They really don't care about the sheep. They really are a hireling. Um, these apostates ought to be afraid for their judgment is coming. The next thing he says, are, they are clouds without water carried about by the winds. In other words, they're empty clouds. There's clouds that promise rain but fail to produce. There are clouds that promise rain but fail to produce. And that becomes a disappointment for a farmer. Uh, the apostates look like men who can give spiritual help and they boast of their abilities, but they are unable to produce. Isaiah 55.10 compares God's word to the rain and snow from heaven that bring fruit on the earth. Like the clouds in the sky, the false teachers may be prominent and even attractive, but their doctrine does not refresh. It doesn't bring rain. It, it doesn't bring fruit. The doctrine is useless. Uh, and then he goes on to say they're dead trees. He said they are late autumn trees without fruit, twice dead, pulled up by the roots. One thing you can be guaranteed of if you go on a ride with my wife in the fall, she will point out every tree along the road. Every beautiful red tree, yellow tree, orange tree. Guaranteed. No, she just is, likes colored leaves. But I noticed something she didn't point out the dead trees. She didn't point out the dead trees. Too late. Um, false teachers, apostates, are dead trees. They're fruitless. Because those who preach and teach the word of God have the responsibility of feeding others false teachers have nothing to give they are fruitless but they are also rootless he says they are twice dead they're twice dead one of the evidence of true salvation is they produce spiritual fruit the seed that fell in the in, that Jesus tells in, in the parable of the soils uh, it fell, falls on hard soil or shallow soil or crowded soil. It does not produce fruit. But the seed that fell on good ground produced fruit. Some of it 20, some of it 40, some of it 100 fold. Four soils good soil or bad soil. And no matter how many Bible verses they may know, their lives are fruitless because they have no spiritual roots. They lack spiritual life. Inside of fruit are seeds. True fruit produces more fruit. The fifth thing they produce is they have are, are raging waves. Now I love swimming. I grew up um, and my freshman year, my mom and dad bought a new home, a, a, another home. It wasn't a new home. Uh, another home, and it had a pool in the backyard. So I grew up swimming. Uh, I took swimming lessons as a kid. I loved swimming. Um, we, had, we were surrounded uh, by lakes. Uh, water was, was everywhere. I would, I would love 
a good, so I even love swimming in the ocean. However, I would not like to do what Brother Ed did in the Coast Guard, where you get into a raging, stormy sea to rescue other people. That is not my idea of a good time. But I thank God for men and women, like Brother Ed, who will do that. Amen? So this picture, though, uh, is not what Jude has in mind of a raging sea. He's using a word picture here of raging waves. He's talking about a person with a big mouth and a tongue that is out of control. And so in verse 16, Jude says, They mouth great swelling words. They mouth great swelling words. In other words, they are arrogant and prideful in their speech. They are, they are like the swelling of the sea. They make a lot of noise, but what do they produce? And he answers that for us. They produce foam. The true teachers of the Word of God are going to bring up the treasures in the deep. False teachers make up false ways from their own mind. And what they boast, they really ought to be ashamed of. They have nothing but foam. The sixth thing that he tells us from here is wandering stars for whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. Now, he's not referring to fixed stars. All right? If I'm lost or I'm looking, okay, which way is north? I'm, I'm like directionally challenged. Um, GPS and I are not good friends. Um, but I know that in the, in the early twilight, the dark... Uh, and as, as dark begins to fall, I can find the brightest star and know that that's probably a good chance that that's the north star. And when I figure out which way is north, I can figure out well, which way is west and east and, all, and, and what's the other direction? Oh, south. Uh, what he's referring to here is, is not fixed stars or planets. Um, they have definite positions. They have definite orbits. He's referring to meteors falling stars that suddenly appear and vanish into the darkness never to be seen again Jesus is compared to a star Christians we are to shine like stars in this dark world the north star I can count on false teachers you can't count on False teachers are here and they're gone like the blackness of darkness forever. They're wandering. And so he says, beware of a, follow, of, of a fall, falling star. Beware, and what he's really telling you here is, beware of following the teaching of man. If it goes against the teaching of the word of God, don't listen to it. Why? Why? because it will lead you into eternal blackness. And so you can see how dangerous these false teachers, apostates, can be and how important it is for you and for the church to keep them out and to keep out that teaching. Verse 16 goes along with these two verses. Um, and he says, These are grumblers, complainers, walking according to their own lusts, and they mouth great swelling words, flattering people to gain advantage. They are murmurers and complainers. They are out to please themselves. They are out to take advantage of other people. It reminds me of what Peter said in 2 Peter 2.14. It is a heart that have... Extra, they, they have a heart... They, they have a heart that is exercised with covetous practices. Another translation is this. Their technique of getting what they want is through long practice and highly developed. They give the impression they are out to help you, but they are interested only in gratifying their own selfish desires. And so what is their approach? Jude says they murmur and complain. 
and they cause others to be dissatisfied with their life. Israel was judged because of complaining. Christians are commanded not to complain. I have a complaint box in my office. You can put your complaints in it. It sits right next to my desk, and Tommy comes and changes it every once or twice a week. Israel was judged. Listen, if a false teacher can make a person critical of his church, of his pastor, of his church doctrine, or they are dissatisfied with their own situation, that person can then lead others into false doctrine. And what do they use? Great swelling words to impress people. Peter said, Peter said they use great swelling words of vanity. They impress people or attempt to by using big words. But what they use is just a lot of hot air. They also use flattery. They want to manipulate their listeners. They want to change the truth of John 6. Do you know John 6, 3.16 is really simple? I mean, let's say it together. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That's so simple. We teach that to our children. They can understand it. But false teachers want to take salvation and make it difficult. They want to take a doctrine like eternal security and make it difficult or baptism and make it difficult. God has given us the word of God and he's given us salvation because he wants us to see that even a five-year-old child can understand it and even a 95-year-old grandmother can understand it. We need to stop making things difficult and just read what Jesus has said is truth what God has given us. This is truth. Knowing truth, knowing these things, I'm amazed that anybody would listen to apostates and follow them. Many people are doing that today. There is something in human nature that causes us to want to believe lies. There is something in human nature that wants us to believe that not everybody is evil that no one could be as evil as Hamas it is evil it is from the pit of hell and the success of the apostates is really only temporary because why well verses uh, 14 and 15 tell us judgment is coming they receive their due penalty. They receive their due penalty. Now Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied about these men also saying, Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment on all, to convict all who are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds, which they have committed in an ungodly way, and of all the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. What do we know about Enoch from Scripture? He walked with God. He was taken to heaven. Anything else? He was the seventh from Adam. Good catch. That's right. Anything else? His kingdom here, millennial kingdom. Okay, he's coming. He's going to return with others. What else? Anything else? Okay. Who is he the father of? Say it again. Good job. You get a you get an A for the day. 
You don't have to take care of any kids the rest of the day. <laughs> Ashley will do it for you. <laughs> the father of Methuselah. And when you read scripture, it says that after Methuselah was born, he began to walk with God. Having children does something to human beings to make them want to walk with God. We don't know a lot. We do know that he says here, Jude says, the seventh from Adam, which means the seventh generation from Adam, and the reason he does that is because there is another Enoch listed in Scripture through the line of Cain. So he wants you to know this is the one from Adam's seed, not through Cain, uh, in a society that was rapidly being polluted and destroyed by sin. Does that kind of sound familiar to you? Enoch walked with God. He kept his life pure. He kept his life clean. He also ministered as a prophet, and he announced a coming judgment. Bible scholars tell us that this quotation that's given to us, Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment on all, to convict those, and so on and so forth, is not found in the Old Testament. This quotation is found in the book of Enoch, which is an apocryphal book. Um, it's a non-biblical book, but it does not mean that that book is inspired, and it doesn't mean that that book is trustworthy. Uh, any more than Paul's quotation from the Greek poets put God's seal of approval on everything. It's like when I use a quote from a movie. Is that an inspired quote that I used? Marriage, it's what brings us here today. Is that an inspired book? Should that go into the Bible? I hope you say no. All right? It just means that I watch too much TV. No, what it does is it fits the period and the time. It fits the period and the time, so it gets used to, it gets used to help us better understand what's really going on. And Jude wants us to be aware of what's really going on. Um, when Enoch originally gave this message, it's possible that he's referring, it's a double referral, one to the coming judgment of the flood, where no one who didn't, no one who, who, who stayed outside of the ark would survive. But I think more than anything, it's a warning to mankind that you will not get away with your evil deeds. Enoch made it clear judgment was coming and that un the ungodly would get what was coming to them. It may peer appear that um, God right now is not paying attention to what's going on. But I want to tell you that God is paying attention. God knows what's going on, and judgment is coming. The final application of this prophecy is to the world in the end times. The very judgment Peter wrote about in 2 Peter 3, the false teachers mocks that prophecy. They argue that Jesus would never come, that God would never send judgment. And there are many Christians today who believe that Jesus is not going to come. And that attitude is proof that the word of God is true. Jesus is going to come. As well as his apostles, his prophets, he will come. Enoch gave his prophecy thousands of years ago. How patient is God with us? He truly is a good God. Amen? What does Enoch's prophecy say about the coming judgment? Okay, here's, here's what it says. It says, first of all, it will be a personal judgment. Look again at verse 14. Enoch the seventh from Adam prophesied about these men, also saying, Behold, the Lord comes. The Lord comes. It's going to be a personal judgment 
judgment. He will come to judge the world. That shows the seriousness of the event and also its finality. Though it is personal, he will not judge it alone. Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousands of his saints. Turn to Revelation chapter 19. Revelation chapter 19. Verse 11. Revelation 19, verse 11. John writes, I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he who sat on him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes were like a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. Who is it? Jesus. And the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, White and clean, that's us. That's thousands of saints who have gathered around the throne. We are going to come, and we are going to be riding on white horses. Are there animals in heaven, people ask? Yes, there are horses in heaven. But all dogs go to heaven. No, no. And there are no way there's cats there. Um Look, you can, read, you can read this on your own because I'm running out of time. Colossians 3, 4 and 1 Thessalonians 3, 13 tell you the same thing. The people of God are going to accompany the Lord when he returns to earth. What for? To defeat his enemies and establish his right, righteous kingdom. Over the centuries, the people of God has suffered at the hands of the ungodly. But one day, one day the tables will be turned. Look, he also tells us it will be a universal judgment. A universal judgment. Jude, uh, he says, to execute judgment on all, to convict all who are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have committed in an ungodly way and of all the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. So we have some new people with us over the past few uh, months, so we need to remind them my definition that I learned in college of all. All right, so say it with me if you remember it. All means all, and that's all means. I didn't finish it. I'm I'm running out of time. Look, it's going to be a universal judgment. It's going to be on everybody. Nobody will escape. The flood destroyed all who were outside the ark. The fire and the brimstone destroyed all that were in Sodom and Gomorrah, except Lot and his wife and his two daughters. The last judgment will encompass all the ungodly. Notice how many times he uses that word ungodly four times. It will be the day of judgment. It will be the day of ruin of ungodly men. It will also be a just judgment. God will convict. He will convince them of their sins. He will declare them guilty. He will pass sentence on them. He will execute the punishment. There will be a judge. It won't be Judy. It will be Jesus Christ. There won't be a jury. There will be persecution, but no defense. Every mouth will be stopped. There will be a sentence. There will be no appeal. There can be no higher court than God's final judgment. The entire procedure will be just Because the righteous, the Holy One, the Son of God will be the judge. He will have the record of their ungodly deeds. He will also have a record of their motives, of their hidden desires, as they committed these deeds, and even these will be ungodly. Verse 15 says he will recall their hard speeches or their harsh speeches, He says they are arrogantly, those things that were arrogantly uttered against him. That idea is that of a rough, a stern, or an uncivil. 
after all these people were murmurers and complainers and they spoke things against Almighty God. And they're not afraid to speak evil of dignitaries, of dignities, but at the judgment their words will testify against him. They spoke great swelling words, but at the end they will speak nothing. And so the pastor needs to warn you of these wolves. You can tell the sheep are in trouble when the shepherd starts speaking kindly of the wolf. There are times when we look at last week's events and we say, God, we echo like the psalmist does, God, how long shall the wicked, how long shall they triumph? How long will they speak and utter harsh things and all the workers of iniquity boast themselves? And the answer is given in Psalm 50, verse 3. Our God shall come and shall not keep silent. A fire shall devour before him, and it shall be very temptuous round about him. Peter wrote these words in 2 Peter 3.13. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. It may appear that evil is winning on our planet, but it doesn't win. Jesus will come. Jesus will judge those who are ungodly. Our job is to keep telling people about Jesus and finish the course. Don't quit. Don't give up. Keep working and keep praying. Even so, Come, Lord Jesus. Amen. We stand with me. We're going to sing hymn of heaven because there's no place I'd rather be than in heaven. And as God's, if God leads you to sing this song, um, then do so. If he leads you to pray, the altar will be open. Whatever you need to do, uh, it'll be your time to deal with. Uh, to deal with God and God's time to deal with you. Father, have your way in each heart and each life that's here today. Father, we, we would be remiss not to pray even at this time for Israel. You tell us to pray for the peace of, Ju uh, of Jerusalem, so we pray for that, Father. We pray that peace and justice would prevail. And Father, we know that in the end, you will come back. Father, we're reminded of that. I pray that each of us will look into our own hearts, make sure there's a time where we believed and we received the free gift of eternal life through your Son, Jesus Christ, and that we are striving to live that out. Lord, I thank you for that. Thank you for all you do for us. Lord, I pray that you would teach us and mold us and shape us into your image. And we thank you for this, in Jesus' name. How I long to breathe the air of heaven Where pain is gone and mercy fills the streets To look upon the one who bled to save me walk with him for all eternity there will be a day when all bow before him there will be a day when death will be no more standing face to face with He who died and rose again Holy, holy is the Lord And every prayer 
We can pray in desperation In the songs of faith We sing through doubt and fear But in the end We'll see that it was worth it When he returns To wipe away our tears Will be a day when all will bow before him There will be a day when death will be no more Standing face to face when he who died and rose again Holy, holy is the Lord Day, we join the resurrection and stand beside the heroes of the faith. And with one voice, a thousand generations sing, Worthy is the Lamb who I slain. And on that day, Join in the resurrection and stand beside the heroes of the faith. And with one voice, a thousand generations sing, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. We shout the hymn of heaven With angels and the saints We raise a mighty roar Glory to our God Who gave His life beyond the grave Holy, holy is the Lord So let it be today Shout the hymn of heaven With the angels and the saints We raise a mighty roar Glory to our God Who gave us life beyond the grave Holy, holy is the Lord Holy, holy is the Lord Holy, holy is the Lord. Father, that you will judge all those for their ungodly deeds. Father, I pray that you would help us to be your witness and to finish strong and faithful to the end. Lord, we thank you for that. And Lord, we look forward to that day where we sing that song, not here, but with you in heaven, surrounding the throne, praising and worshiping you. And Lord, we look forward to that day in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. Thank you all. Uh, I'll just give you a couple announcements, and we'll get out of here. Um, there is something down there. I don't know what it's about. Something about the parade. Uh, do you want to say something? We're, she's not even here, so... There's so, all right. Go. You you always saying something. Go ahead.
Hey to you.